Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Agilent Technologies Q2 2024 earnings call. My name is Regina, and I will be coordinating your call today. If you would like to ask a question following the presentation, you may do so by pressing star 1 on your telephone. I will now hand you over to your host, Parmita Huja, to begin. Please go ahead. Thank you, and welcome, everyone, to Agilent's conference call for the second quarter of fiscal year 2024. With me are Pori McDonald, Agilent President and CEO, and Bob McMahon, Agilent Senior Vice President and CFO. Joining in the Q&A will be Phil Benz, President of the Agilent Life Sciences and Applied Markets Group, Simon May, a newly named President of the Agilent Diagnostics and Genomics Group, and Angelica Ryman, President of the Agilent Cross Lab Group. This presentation is being webcast live. The news release for our second quarter financial results, investor presentation, and information to supplement today's discussion, along with the recording of this webcast, are available on our website at www.investor.agilent.com. Today's comments will refer to non-GAAP financial measures. You will find the most directly comparable GAAP financial metrics and reconciliations on our website. Unless otherwise noted, all references to increases or decreases in financial metrics are year over year, and references to revenue growth are on a core basis. Core revenue growth excludes the impact of currency and any acquisitions and divestitures completed within the past 12 months. Guidance is based on forecasted exchange rates. As previously announced, beginning in the first quarter of fiscal 2024, we implemented certain changes to our segment reporting structure related to the move of our cell analysis business from LSAG into DGG. We have recast our historical segment information to reflect these changes. These changes have no impact on our company's consolidated financial statements. During this call, we will also make forward-looking statements about the financial performance of the company. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties and are only valid as of today. The company assumes no obligation to update them. Please look at the company's recent SEC filings for a more complete picture of our risk and other factors. And now, I'd like to turn the call over to Porik. Thanks, Parmeet. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's call. I want to begin by saying I'm incredibly honored to serve as CEO of this great company, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to lead such a talented team. I truly believe the Agilent team is second to none, and I'm energized about the future possibilities that lie ahead of us. I also want to take this time to welcome our new DGG president, Simon May, to the Agilent team. Simon's diversified experience, strong technical skills, and growth mindset will be a key asset in this role. Since starting earlier this month, Simon has hit the ground running, and I am really looking forward to him helping move DGG and Agilent forward. Before I talk about the quarterly results, I'd like to tell you how I've spent my time since the announcement in February that I would become Agilent CEO. I've been meeting and connecting with employees, customers, and shareholders around the world to listen to their perspectives on how we should build on our strengths and evolve Agilent. What they have told me is clear. Agilent must become even more customer-focused and even more nimble to continue to win in the marketplace and add value to customers and shareholders. This has really resonated with our employees and customers. As an energized Agilent team, we will evolve our strategy, adapting quickly to market trends and changes while accelerating our pace of innovation in areas of greatest return for long-term growth. We will double down on our customer-first culture, deepening our relationship to further enhance our market-leading customer experience that is already the best in the industry. Now let's talk about the Q2 results and outlook moving forward. In a challenging market environment, the Agilent team delivered on expectations. In the second quarter, we reported revenue of $1.573 billion, a 7.4% decline. This was against a tough compare of 9.5% growth in Q2 of last year. While revenues declined in the quarter, our book to bill was greater than one, and orders grew year over year for the first time in seven quarters. Earnings per share of $1.22 beat our expectations and represented a 4% decline from the second quarter of 2023. Now, looking forward, the market environment continues to be challenging, but we are seeing early signs of recovery. 
However, as we announced in our press release, this market recovery is not at the pace we anticipated when we provided guidance earlier in the year. As a result, we are reducing our market growth expectations and revising our full year core revenue to be in the range of $6.42 billion to $6.5 billion, and growth to decline between 4.3 and 5.4%. We now expect earnings per share to be between $5.15 and $5.25 for the year. We have responded quickly to the lower market growth expectations and are taking difficult but necessary actions to streamline our cost structure. These actions will allow us to invest in our most promising growth opportunities, while also delivering incremental annualized savings of $100 million by the end of the fiscal year. We are sharpening our focus on key growth vectors, such as biopharma, PFAS, and advanced materials, while also investing in our digital ecosystem and accelerating our innovation to drive even faster execution. And we are leveraging our strong balance sheet and plan to repurchase $750 million of our common stock across the third and fourth quarters, over and above our normal anti-dilutive repurchases. Bob will provide more details on our results and latest outlook in his remarks. Getting back to Q2 results, as expected, all end markets saw declining revenue in Q2. Geographically, the Americas and Europe came in slightly ahead of expectations, while China lagged. Despite the challenging market conditions, our Agile team stayed close to our customers and continues to leverage our strong relationships with them to execute remarkably well while maintaining strong cost discipline. When we look at our performance by business unit, the Life Sciences and Applied Markets Group reported $754 million in revenue, down 13%. The group saw a decline across all end markets and regions, with consumables being a bright spot. Consumables grew into low single digits, driven by chemical and advanced materials, food, and environmental and forensics. Also, while relatively small, we continue to see strong growth in our pre-owned instrument business. The LSAG team continues to innovate, introducing two new instruments this quarter that extend our applied markets leadership. First, our 7010D GC triple quad instrument delivers exceptional sensitivity for customers in the environmental PFAS and advanced materials markets, designed for analysis that demand the lowest limits of detection. And second is our 8850GC, a distinguished new member of our market-leading GC portfolio. The 8850 is ultra-fast in separation and cool-down speeds, with design innovations that enable customers to run tests up to twice as fast as regular benchtop GC. And it's the smallest high-performance benchtop GC on the market. Plus, it's sustainable, using up to 30% less electricity power compared with a traditional benchtop GC. Now moving on to the Agilent Crosslab Group, which delivered revenue of $402 million for the quarter, up 5%. ACG grew across all end markets in every region except China. The business delivered double-digit growth in services contracts, which now represent almost 70% of the total business, offset by declines in new instrument installation revenues. The ongoing strength in our contracted business speaks to our strategy of increasing the connect rates on our instruments and the ongoing value we are providing to our customers. The Diagnostics and Genomics Group posted $417 million in revenue, representing an 8% decline. Pathology was up mid-single digits globally and was more than offset by declines in the mid-20s in cell analysis due to the constrained capital environment for instrumentation. NASD declined low teens as expected, driven by more clinical products being produced this year versus Q2 of last year. Europe was a bright spot for DGG, growing low single digits in the quarter, while Americas and China declined. Despite the subdued market environment, we continue to innovate in our cell analysis business. We recently introduced the Agilent Spectral Flow Cytometer, which allows our customers to perform sophisticated experiments that expand the range of the research on the same easy-to-use Novasci platform. Bob will now provide details on our results as well as our outlook for the remainder of the year. After Bob delivers his comments, I will be back for some closing remarks. Over to you, Bob. Thanks, Porig, and good afternoon, everyone. In my remarks today, 
I will provide some additional details on revenue in the quarter, as well as take you through the income statement and other key financial metrics. I'll then cover our updated full year and third quarter guidance. Q2 revenue was $1.573 billion, a decline of 7.4% core. On a reported basis, currency had a negative impact of 0.8 percentage points, while M&A had a negative impact of 0.2%, resulting in a reported decline of 8.4%. As Porig mentioned, pharma, our largest end market, declined 11% with both biopharma and small molecule declining roughly the same percentage. Instrument demand continues to be constrained while services delivered mid-single-digit growth. Looking forward, while we have seen sentiment improve, instrument purchases are still constrained, and we are expecting that to continue for the rest of the year. In addition, we have reduced our expectations for NASD as several clinical programs have pushed out into next year, and some commercial products have not ramped at the pace as expected. As a result, we have reduced our full-year growth outlook for the pharma end market from roughly flat to down low double digits, similar to our Q2 performance. Our revised expectation for the pharma end market is the largest change in our outlook. The chemical and advanced materials market was better than expected declining 3% after coming off a very tough comparison of 16% growth last year. The academia and government market declined 12% against a tough compare of 11% growth last year. While soft globally, the decline was driven by China, which was down mid-30s. Our business in the diagnostics and clinical market declined 2%. Our pathology business continues to show resilience in this market, growing mid-single digits while our NGS QC instrumentation business also grew slightly. These were offset by softness in our NGS chemistries business. The environmental and forensics market declined 2%. The business grew mid-single digits ex-China, highlighted by continued strength in serving the rapidly expanding PFAS opportunity. The food market declined 13% on a very tough compare of 21% growth last year, heavily impacted by the low 30s decline in China. On a geographic basis, all regions declined. The Americas region was down 5%, Europe was down 3%, while Asia Pacific ex-China was down slightly. China was down 21%, missing our expectations of a mid-teens decline. We saw demand weakness expand beyond pharma. As a result, we have revised our full year expectations for China from a mid-single digit decline to a double-digit decline. We have seen funnel activity increase because of the recently announced stimulus program, but we are not assuming any revenue impact in our fiscal year. Moving down the P&L, our second quarter gross margin was 55.6%, up 30 basis points from a year ago, as productivity and cost savings were offset by lower demand and mix. Our operating margin of 25.1% was down year over year as expected. Below the line, we benefited from greater than expected interest income and a lower tax rate. Our tax rate was 12.5% and we had 293 million diluted shares outstanding. Putting it all together, Q2 earnings per share were $1.22, down 4% from a year ago, less than the decline in revenue and ahead of our expectations. Now let me turn to cash flow in the balance sheet. Operating cash flow was $333 million in the quarter, and we invested $103 million in capital expenditures as we continue our planned NASD expansion. We returned $299 million to shareholders in the quarter, $69 million through dividends, and $230 million through repurchase shares catching up on our anti-dilutive buying year-to-date. In summary, we met our expectations for the quarter, and our markets are recovering, but at a slower pace than we anticipated. We are directing our energy towards high-growth opportunities and are committed to delivering value to our customers and our shareholders. Now on to our revised outlook for the year and our third quarter guidance. We now expect full-year revenue to be in the range of 6.42 to $6.50 billion, 
This represents a decline of 6.0 to 4.9% on a reported basis and a decline of 5.4 to 4.3 on a core basis. Currency and M&A combined are a headwind of 60 basis points. This is a $300 million reduction at the midpoint and is primarily related to changes in two areas, China overall and the pharma end market outside of China. For China, we have reduced our expectations to a double-digit decline from mid-single digits with all end markets being reduced. This represents roughly $70 million of the guidance reduction. The remainder of the change in the pharma end market globally outside of China is due to two factors. The first and largest factor is continued caution in budget releases and extended approval times for instrumentation purchases in both small and large molecules. This is roughly $175 million of the change. The second factor is related to NASD due to the reasons I mentioned earlier and represents the remaining $55 million reduction. While down from our previous guidance, we are expecting growth in the second half of the year to be roughly 400 basis points better than the first half of the year and plan to exit the year roughly flat year on year at the midpoint of the new guidance. Full-year non-GAAP earnings per share are now expected to be between $5.15 and $5.25, representing a decline of 5.3 to 3.5%. This incorporates a roughly $35 million expense reduction due to the actions Porig mentioned, the majority hitting Q4 in order to help mitigate the bottom line impact of the change to our revenue guidance. It also assumes a 13% tax rate and $292 million fully diluted shares outstanding. We will leverage our strong balance sheet and plan to repurchase $750 million of our shares in the second half of the year, in addition to our anti-dilutive repurchases. We expect these repurchases to be weighted towards Q3. All told, we expect to return roughly $1.4 billion to shareholders this year between dividends and share repurchases. In addition, the board authorized a new $2 billion share repurchase program that will go into effect August 1st and replace the existing authorization. Now for our Q3 guidance. We expect revenue will be in the range of $1.535 to $1.575 billion. This represents a decline of 8.2 to 5.8% on a reported basis and a decline of 6.9 to 4.5 on a core basis. Currency and M&A combined for a headwind of 130 basis points. Third quarter, non-GAAP earnings per share are expected to be between $1.25 and $1.28, representing a decline of 12.6 to 10.5%. Looking forward, we remain disciplined. We're focusing on what we can control and driving strong execution in a challenging market. And we are optimistic about the long-term future. Now back to Porig. When I joined you last quarter as CEO-elect, I said Agilent has a compelling story to tell, and I was excited by the possibilities that lie before us as we help our customers bring great science to life. That excitement has only grown. I spent 26 years at Agilent, first starting as a field employee before moving to sales and then leading some of our businesses. I know Agilent's strengths and its opportunities very well. We are in great long-term growth markets. And while the markets are recovering slower than anticipated, they are recovering. This company is a leader across key platforms, making us uniquely qualified to support our customers in their missions to solve some of the world's most important problems. And our customers value their relationships with us because we offer them an unparalleled experience. And as I said earlier, that is a competitive differentiator in the market. The actions we are now taking, while difficult, will enable us to quickly capitalize on growth opportunities as the markets fully recover. I know the future is bright, and we will forge an enduring company that sets the standard for excellence with our customers and creates value for our shareholders. Thank you again for joining today's call. I look forward to continued dialogue with all of you. Parmeet, over to you for Q&A. Thanks, Bori. Regina, if you could please provide instructions for the Q&A now. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone now. If you change your mind, please press 
star 1 again to withdraw your question. When preparing to ask your question, please ensure that your phone is unmuted locally. Our first question will come from the line of Matt Sykes with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thanks for taking my questions. Um, maybe just the first one is more of a timing question on China. I mean, we've we've been through a lot of quarterly results this uh, this season, and, and the stabilization theme in China has been pretty consistent, and you guys have talked about sequential stabilization over the last number of quarters. So was this really an April impact that you saw in China? And if so, what was sort of the steep deceleration that you saw there, and what were some of the causes of it? Yeah, thanks, Matt. I think, you know, while Q2 was relatively soft uh, to guidance, we adjusted the H2 outlook. What we're seeing in China is we saw a number of stability over a number of quarters. Uh, what we what we really believe is that this is not a material uh, deterioration from that. But what we've seen is that um, we've seen the stimulus have some effect, and the stimulus has been um, much larger than previous stimulus. It's over multi years, and of course, Customers are looking about uh, what what is the components of that, and they're looking at um, some of the areas in, in where it's going to help them. So that has had a material effect. We don't we don't see the stimulus having a, an impact in H2, but we do think it's going to have a, um, an impact in uh, in 25. I think there's a kind of a direct and indirect um, side of the stimulus. I think on the direct side, you see this delay, um, which is, is is normal, but you see also the indirect side where. The government is investing in technology and science is going forward, which creates a lot of, I would say, future momentum. Got it. Thanks for that part. And then just for my follow-up, you guys have often talked about sort of 18 to 24-month down cycle in the LC replacement cycle. And I'm just wondering, just given some of the comments you made around biopharma, given that's an important customer segment for that, have you kind of changed those views in terms of what the LC replacement cycle will look like and what the potential recovery in the replacement cycle will look like? I think – you know, uh, so, some were thinking sort of towards the end of this year, but is this more now into 2025? And has that replacement cycle been extended in terms of recovery? Yeah, we don't we don't see any material change. But Bob, I don't know if you want to add some color on that. Yeah, I think Matt, uh, as you're saying, we're still expecting improvement in the back half of this year, just not at the pace that we had expected, and and so we're not seeing any material extension of kind of the use case for uh, LC or an LCMS in in the marketplace, and are still expecting recovery in 25. Thanks very much. Our next question will come from the line of Jack Meehan with Nephron Research. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. I um, was wondering if you could share what's the new sales outlook for NASD this year, and can you talk about, like, bridging from kind of the second half to some of the longer-term targets you've had previously? Like, what are you assuming in terms of kind of progression after this year? Yeah, I mean, the, the NASD business, you know, we, we talked before about the business being about 50% commercial and 50% clinical. That's changed um, a bit to be more more like 75% uh, clinical and 25% commercial. We've seen the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, having an impact um, on the price provisioning. So what you see with farmer partners, they're looking for larger indications instead of smaller smaller indications. So what we've seen is, I would call it an air pocket in in Q3, um, our, our, our clinical business is actually growing. Orders are growing about 50 percent. So we're we, we have a good order book on that side. So it's a, a readjustment, and we see that uh, readjustment go through H2 and beyond. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Bob. Yeah, I think Jack, to um, to add some numbers to what Porg was saying here. Um, you know, originally we were expecting it to be uh, roughly flat. Uh, which would have said a roughly a $350 million business. We're now saying roughly $300 million uh, this year. Um, as as Porig is mentioning, um, we're expecting to build back from there as these clinical programs uh, move through uh, the, uh, the clinical pathway and are expecting to have more more volume in, in 25. And I would say, you know, our, our uh, long-term perspective on NASD remains unchanged. We're still very excited about that opportunity and uh, are still building, you know, the uh, building out the capacity in uh, in our Colorado site. Yeah, I think okay, the second great. question, I think the second part of the question was about 25. Yep. Um, you know, we'll grow next year, and you, as you can see in our guidance that we're anticipate, we really are anticipating improving conditions across the second half. But it's too early to talk about specific ranges for next year. Uh, we want to wait to see how uh, pacing uh, an improvement pans out in the second half. Okay. 
Thank you. And then on the cost savings program, I think I heard talk about $100 million. I just wanted to clarify, is that incremental to the 175 you previously talked about? And where are those, you know, any color on where the savings is coming from? Thank you. Yeah, it is incremental to the, the savings that we've already built into into the plan, um, and we're expecting to get that annualized savings by the end of the year. It's primarily um, headcount related, um, Jack. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from the line of Patrick Donnelly with City. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, maybe one on the instrument side, I guess it would be China and, and just broadly – you know, I know a few quarters ago you guys felt like, you know, orders were picking up, the funnel looked okay, but it was really that, I think, Bob, you said it was the velocity of conversion of those orders and that funnel to revenue. Is that what you're seeing is just that continues to stretch out the visibility into that normalizing? It's just proving to be a little trickier. Um, yeah, I just want to talk to, I guess, that instrument piece because, again, you sound okay on the orders and the funnel and the conversation. But, but that converting over to revs, I guess that I just want to talk through again that conversion piece and, and the velocity of the conversion. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I think at an, a natural level, as we talked about, our book to bill was was greater than one, which is a positive sign, and where where orders grew year over year. On the on the instrument side, uh, um, the orders grew low, low single digits, excluding China, but declined low single digits overall. So what we're really seeing is that our our funnel is really stable. Uh, but we're seeing those extended um, purchasing decisions being continuing to extend um, out through the second half. Yeah, I think, Patrick, to, to build on what Porg is saying, you know, at the beginning of the year we were expecting, you know, when we were talking primarily to our pharma customers, you know, budgets weren't being materially cut outside of a specific number of uh, well-publicized customers. And we were expecting to see by the, our second quarter some of these budgets being released. And, and what we're seeing now is still a very cautious environment. And so the funnel is still there. We are seeing, you know, our book to bill, is, as um, Porig mentioned, to be greater than, than one. We just haven't seen that inflection, which we would have expected to see, at least in our order book. You know, one of the things that we, we do see, and it primarily happened late in the quarter, is, you know, our teams are paid um, on um, – on uh, first half versus second half quota. And so our, our April numbers are usually um, quite large, which prepares us for, for the um, for Q3. And we just didn't see that inflection in, uh, in, in late April, which we normally would see. Okay, that's helpful, Colin. And then maybe to follow up on Jack's question on NASD there, um, you know, understand the revenue change. How are you guys thinking about uh, you know, the capital investment on that front, obviously it's, it's been sizable in the past years. You know, you've often talked about, you know, the, the continued expansions of the trains. How do you think about, you know, the, the CapEx devoted to this over the next few years? Has there been any change in terms of push out of, of that capital or how you're thinking about um, the potential investment in, in the expansion on this front, just given the, the shifting revenue here? Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I think despite some near-term headwinds that we have, the medium long-term story for NSAD is really holds firm. And as I said before, we're, we're seeing our clinical business grow more than 50% this year, and we, we really remain ex excited about the expansion of customers. And, and, you know, getting back to the therapeutic class um, that we're involved in with SI, SIRNAs, um, drugs, you know, we're seeing those approvals for drugs increase substantially in 2023. And being an integral uh, part of the manufacture of, of several of these on-market therapeutics, the future is extremely bright in this area, so no, no change in our capital investment. Yeah, hey, Patrick, just one other thing to add on to that is, as is, is, um, I'm sure you're aware, you know, as part of that expansion, not only are we expanding capacity, we're also uh, expanding our therapeutic options. So not only SIRNA, but also Antisense and then also CRISPR opportunities. So it also provides us with more capabilities to support our our existing and, and new client base. Got it. Thank you, guys. Our next question will come from the line of Vijay Kumar with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I guess uh, Flores or Bob, yeah, th thanks for uh, laying out the, uh, the the changes in the guidance assumptions here, right? Um, I think part of it was China. Uh, part of it was NASD. But more than half, I think, it's, it's coming from, from pharma cautiousness that outside of China, 
uh, XNASDA, which uh, I, I think, um, you know, that's the, that for the market. I, I thought we were expecting stabilization. Is this a funding environment, uh, you know, kind of question, or is this elections, or uh, uh, what change? Because second quarter, it feels like uh, revenues were roughly in line. Um, was it the exit rate? Can you just talk about what the exit rate trends were and what customers are telling you? Yeah, I mean, on the on the pharma instrumentation side, in terms of guidance, we see an impact of about 175 million, and it really is simply pharma's willingness to spend and capital equipment remains challenged um, over time. And again, it, customers are focusing on lab efficiency and productivity, but based on what we're hearing from customers, these trends will continue. Um, to impact the second half, and that's why we're low, lowering our expectations around that instrument piece. But I will say that the funnels, funnels are holding very strong. The conversations are very robust with customers, so we do expect it to uh, improve um, going into next year. Yeah, hey, VJ, to, to build on what uh, Porig is saying, you know, the guidance that we're building out right now is, is based on what we're seeing today. It doesn't assume any meaningful inflection. That's certainly, I'd characterize this as a prudent guide, you know, given what we know today. Certainly, we're not assuming any of that inflection. Um, you bring up a number of variables which are hard to quantify around, you know, in, um, the, uh, the um, upcoming election and, and so forth. But we don't think it's a funding issue. Um, we, we do feel like uh, we are seeing bio, uh, biotech funding coming up. Um, obviously, on the small molecule side, um, those are they're well capitalized companies. It's just a, a very um, it's still cautious in terms of them getting through their approval processes. And just maybe related to that, uh, Oregon Bob, I think um, is this. Just a few handful of customers, or is this across the board? Because um, obviously the next question is: um, is um, um, is this a share loss, or is this uh, is this more of um, you know what gives you the confidence that this is just a push out and not a share share? And on on, on the um, savings here, cost savings, Bob, that 35 is in Q4, so the the expectations is the incremental 65 is for uh, fiscal uh, 25. Uh, let me answer the last question first. So that is a, a cumulative number for the second half of the year. We'll see some of that happen here in Q3 and, and roughly be at that $100 million run rate in Q4, so roughly about a $25 million run rate. And then we'll get the full um, incremental 65, you know, obviously next year as, as we go into the into the business. Do you want to comment? Yeah. On? Yeah, no, look, when we look across our pharma customers, you know, we see – uh, generally, it's across the board. We do have some customers that are a little bit more positive than negative this year, um, but overall, I would say it's a market area, a market, uh, a market effect. What I would say um, on, on the other question, this is definitely a macro story, not a market market share story. And in fact, when we look at our mar objective market share data, we're holding or even gaining in some areas. And I will I will remind you know not to, to comment on our peers in this area, but we we have a month ahead. Um, in what we're seeing on it, but we're seeing very robust market share numbers coming in. Understood. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Dan Brennan with TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, maybe the first one is on China. You talked about, um, in response to an earlier question about the stimulus is delaying demand this year. Could you just speak through that a little bit? Like, what's your visibility on that? Any any way to get a sense of how much of the weight you should be seeing in China? It's customers waiting to see the final details of the stimulus. And I know you also alluded to, like, this could be a big impact in 25. Can you just speak through that a little bit? Yeah. Look, I think um, having worked with China for many years, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a multi-year program as opposed to the last one, which I think was a year program in the shorter term. Um, so it's it's very encouraging to see it. Uh, we've seen some proposals from customers, but they're still, quite frankly, trying to work out what 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 uh, what are the mechanisms for the funding as we go forward. So we're seeing a lot of activity around that. And, and I would say, you know, in terms of of the confidence boost, we do really see that in 25 we're go or we're going to get some um, benefit from this, but really too early to tell on it. So we're we're taking down our our guidance in the second half, primarily related to this. Yeah, hey, Dan, this is Bob. Um, to, to build on that, I, I mentioned in our prepared remarks that bid activity has actually improved. And so we're seeing a number of proposals working with our customers to actually, um, you know, get a, get a piece of the stimulus. 
What's not yet clear is the timing of the release of that budget, uh, you know, because it goes from the provincial or from the state down to the provincial and then to the local government. And so we've taken a, you know, what I would say is a conservative approach to assuming none of that uh, stimulus money will actually, um, we'll, we'll see any of that in the second half of the year. Um, but it will come. It will come. And uh, so if it comes earlier, that, that would be a benefit to what we're forecasting right now. But we're, what we, we did see, you know, particularly in April, is a little slowing down of normal bid process waiting to, to, to get access to that money. And uh, so we think that that's just a transitory uh, change, not a, a structural change. Got it. Thanks. And, and then and maybe just one more on farm, if you don't mind. So, you know, the instrument growth was so powerful for yourselves and some of your peers coming out of COVID. Um, is there any chance that, like, the slowdown you're seeing now may be just a miscalculation? Maybe there was such instrument demand and purchases done in the last couple of years that customers are, work, you know, just kind of kind of working through that, all those purchases, versus, like, you know, an exceptional slowdown right now given the macro. Just maybe speak a little bit to that if you could about the overhang for maybe the strength in the past couple of years versus what you're seeing real time now. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. We, we've, you know, tremendous um, uh, growth rates during during the post-COVID period, but we don't see anything fundamentally changing with, with the, the cycle on instruments, replacement cycles. We don't see it's a kind of a rundown of uh, available instruments or anything like that because lab activity is very, very high. We see that across the board. Um, we actually see activity on the sales side, but also on the support side, uh, very, very high. So, uh, we 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 think it's prim primarily actually on, on the on the and the macro macro situation. Yeah, and Dan, just to kind of um, build on what Porig is saying, if we looked at uh, you know ACG and our CSD or our consumables business outside of China, both of those grew mid to high single digits in the quarter. So it does speak to lab activity. They're not having instruments just sitting idle, and. Uh, you know, in, in ACG, you know, our contracted services business continues to perform extraordinarily well, um, you know, up double digits. So the demand is there outside of China right now. Our next question will come from the line of Rachel Vadenstahl with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for taking the question. So first up, I just wanted to ask on China. We've seen some of the headlines around Biosecure Act. So I was wondering if you could break down your exposure to large CDMOs in the region and if that contributed to any of the weakness there, just given we've seen some of the commentary from an RFP standpoint. And then just on China stimulus and some of the dynamics there, how should we think about local competition competing for some of these dollars on the stimulus dynamic? And you talked about some of these proposals that you're working on. So can you detail what sectors, what types of customers are you really seeing that proposal work be done right now? Thanks. Yeah, look, look at I think on the Biosecure Act, we, we see normal, you know, people are looking at their supply chains and, you know, that's a positives and negatives around the globe as, as you see that. One of the areas that we've seen from that is actually we see a, a benefit on our service business as we relocate laboratories in some cases and get them up and running quickly uh, with, with our services on, on that one. So definitely so, some exposure to CDMO, but I would say not, not the overall um, macro side on it. And, and then in, I think the second part, Bob, I don't know if you want to take that one. Yeah, I would say just a building on that on that, uh, that point on um, our questions around CDMO, you know, most of our business in China is, is, is local, um, so it's not uh, multinational and uh, so wouldn't necessarily fall under the Biosecure Act. There are certain large companies that are on that list uh, that are customers of ours, but that is that business has, has been um, uh, pretty muted for, for a while, and, and that's not the cause of the incremental um, weakness here. I would say on the, on the, on the bid um, activity, it's, about, it's across the board. Uh, it's not in, in uh, you know, one, uh, one region of the country or one end market uh, or, or customers. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, Chinese local competitors are, are going to be vying for that uh, business uh, like uh, like we are. But uh, I think we've shown time and time again our ability to provide very uh, strong and robust instrumentation coupled with uh, very, um, very good um, uh, service. And so I don't think uh, that uh, we're in any, any uh, disadvantage from a, uh, from a local perspective from that standpoint. In fact, Bob, I would say our our scale and service there really makes it a differentiator where we can we can scale with customers and get them up and running very very quickly. 
we, we take the competition very seriously, and um, but we've always had competition in China, and we continue to uh, keep a focus on that. Great, and then for my follow-up, just given some of the moving pieces on this fiscal 3Q guide, could you walk us through your expectations by segment for 3Q? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that real quick. Um, by, um, by business group, we're expecting LSAG to be down double digits, uh, DGG down mid-single, and ACG growing at uh, mid-single digits. If we looked at by end market, um, pharma, as I mentioned in the prepared remarks, would be down very similar to Q2, so down uh, low uh, double digits. And uh, with academia and, and, and uh, diagnostics markets being roughly flat, chemical and advanced materials being very similar to Q3 or Q2's results. And then food um, uh, being down uh, roughly the same, uh, maybe a little better than where we saw Q2 as well. Um, and then environmental and forensics, similar similar performance as Q2. Our next question will come from the line of Doug Schenkel with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Uh, hey, guys. Um, I want to start by, I, I, I guess I have two high level, but I, I think important questions. Um, one is, you know, simply put, I, I want to get your thoughts as we sit here today about, you know, the company's long-term growth outlook and, you know, essentially to what top line growth rate are you managing the business as you think about the next few years? In pharma and biotech, you have less exposure as a percentage of sales to some of the higher growth areas of that end market. And, you know, the outlook for one of your higher growth areas, um, NASD, within biopharma, you know, is certainly in, in question amongst investors given how things have been going recently. And while there's hope that China stimulus will help across many end markets, um, you know, as we kind of think past that, ultimately many believe the durable growth rate in China where you're overexposed will be materially lower than what we've seen in years past. And then as we think of, you know, other discrete differentiating growth drivers for the company, you know, when we look at Cross Labs and DGG, you know, the growth rates have moderated there, you know, in part because of the market, but also in part because, you know, you did have above average concentration uh, with once high growth diagnostic companies as an example. So, you know, there's a lot of bad guys here right now. Obviously, in the long term, you know, there's a lot of belief in, in Agilent and how you run the business. But I, I think there are a lot of questions, you know, when you kind of pull all this together about what is the inherent growth rate of this business. Um, can you share any thoughts on that? Maybe I'll, I'll kick it off at, the, at, at a high level. I think, first of all, we participate in excellent markets with multiple long-term growth drivers. You look at the characterization that's going to be needed in bio, biotherapeutics and time, you know, improving human health, you know, quality of our food is really – uh, is really going to be a, a continued growth driver for the, for the company. There's, I would say there's a lot of growth factors within the business um, that in adjacent markets where we continue to invest in those opportunities. You've seen parts of Biopharma, PFAS, and, and I do believe in NASD long-term is, is going to t continue to grow. Uh, you know, in our service business, you know, we expect that to grow high single digits over the long term as we increase our attach rate, which is not a small point because every percentage increase in the tax rate is about $30 million incremental on that side. So, so overall, I think we're in, we're in ex, you know, extremely uh, durable long-term markets. On the China story, you know, we're going to see probably getting down to more mature level growth rates in China, but I would remind everybody that there is secular drivers in China that continue to come up and the government continues to invest in science and technology, but also the scale of the country being so large we benefit uh, tremendously from the, uh, the aftermarket element consumables and service around that and being able to kind of drive uh, attachment to some of the emerging workflows. But, Bob, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I would, I would just say, um, you know, if we think about kind of our long-term algorithm that we've been talking about, that 5 to 7 percent, we're not ready to, to walk away from that. Uh, I think we still feel good about that. And, uh I think while you talked about some of the bad guys, um, we still believe in biopharma um, and are, are continuing to invest there. In addition, um, you know, Porg mentioned a few uh, things on the applied side, we are, where we are the undisputed leader. So things like PFAS, the electrification, semiconductors, uh, those things weren't there 
five years ago to the extent that they're going to be there in the next five years. So, um, you know, certainly the markets are, are a bit challenging right now, but we are seeing them re recover, and uh, we would expect to be able to get back to those rates uh, in the near term. Okay. Thank you for that. And, and Bob, maybe sticking with you, if, if we go back to the beginning of the year when you set guidance for the fiscal year, you know, there, I think it's fair to say there were a number of questions from the investment community about how you were setting guidance for the year. Specifically, there was concern about the plausibility of what you assumed for the second half. In hindsight, obviously, these questions and concerns to, you know, to be well-founded. You know, what, what went wrong? Um, you know, does, does this tell you something about, you know, visibility for the business? If so, is, is it a transitory issue? And, it, and if, if that's the case, can you help us explain why? And if, and if it's not visibility, what do you need to do in terms of changing your guidance philosophy moving forward? Yeah, thanks, Doug. And, and I think it is um, uh, some visibility. I, I think if you looked across the last seven seven years, the two most volatile years have been the last two. And, and so um, I think uh, we were expecting, based on the feedback that we got from our customers, that uh, they would be releasing budgets much more uh, quickly than, than what they have, uh, or at least what we're seeing. And uh, while we did have a, um, you know, expectation that uh, we were going to see uh, an inflection in the back half of this year, you know, when we were talking to our customers, it just hasn't happened. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think um, the the visibility um, is uh, something that I think will uh, we will we will get back, particularly as we have more uh, recurring revenue and continue to have the connect rate onto the services business. And um, I, I um, you know we're we're uh, we're disappointed as uh, as everyone else is, but uh, but you can rest assured that um, you know we're going to come out of this stronger going forward. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Dan Leonard with UBS. Please go ahead. Dan, your line might be on mute. Our next question will come from the line of Michael Riskin with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. I want to pick things up uh, exactly where you just ended on the last answer with Doug on, on visibility. So, I mean, you kind of talked about how you had a certain set of expectations going into the year based on conversations with customers that didn't play out. Um, I mean, is that is there any reason to think that visibility is better now, I guess, is, is my question. You know, if we look at the guide change and specifically focusing on pharma, um, you know, with or without an ASD, if you want to just talk about pharma, you know, the CapEx or pharma and an ASD, it seems like visibility there is still really, really challenged. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, a lot of your prepared remarks are markets are improving, but on the other hand, you know, you're not expecting it in 3Q because you just talked about world double digits. It doesn't seem like you're expecting it for the rest of the year. So just exiting the year, entering next year, uh, how do we know we're not going to be having the same conversation again about another push out and then another push out? Um, just talk about that visibility going forward. Yeah, I think if we look at, uh, you know, just first half, second half, and, and look at where our, our core guidance is, it's not assuming any inflection in the back half. I mean, you know, you, you could make an argument that typically, you know, we have a, a higher uh, weighting towards the back half of the year, just part of normal seasonality, and, and we're not assuming that in our guide. And so if you look at also pharma, we're assuming it's down roughly the same as it's been in the first half of the year, but we'll get easier compares. Um, and so we're not expecting, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, a, a big inflection in the in the back half of the year. Uh, I would say also on NASD, which we are assuming a um, a reduction in the second half of the year relative to the first half of the year. We have all those orders in house, and so we've got a plan, uh, a production plan, and uh, both for Q3 and Q4. And and while something could happen. It's not like we're looking for orders to, to guide us on those. And those are the two big areas um, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, made the, you know, uh, the biggest change when I think about where we were back in November, um, giving guidance to rel where, where we are today. Okay. And, Bob, since you touched on 3Q, 4Q ramp, I'm, I'm going to follow up on that as well, actually. 
Yeah, I mean, you normally do see some seasonality uh, third quarter, the fourth quarter, you know, depending on the year, depending on the comp. Uh, let's call it about 100 million, maybe 100 million plus. You're so than that, you know, your guy for three Q and, and fiscal year implies about 120 million um, three Q to four Q this year. So again, not excessive, but still some step up. And it seems like you know, two Q and three Q certainly are below trend. Um, so. Is there any risk to that 4Q number? I mean, is there anything else we should be thinking about in terms of um, what makes that achievable besides just comp and, and seasonality? Thanks. Yeah, the biggest the biggest change there is our NASD business, which um, we will see a, a low water point here in Q3. If we, you know, what we ended up seeing is uh, some of these clinical programs getting pushed out. Uh, they've got pushed out from Q3 into into Q4. Um, and so there's a $30 million incremental um, step up from Q3 to Q4. So if you took that out, we we did get back to a more historical kind of level. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks. Our next question will come from the line of Dan Arias with Steeple. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for the question. Bob or Perry, on the, on the capital equipment portfolio and the order book and the sales funnel that you have there, Maybe just in simplistic terms, how would you describe the average time to deal close that it feels like you're going to be working with in the back half of the year versus what you've seen as a historical average? And embedded in that is just this question on instrument demand that you have a line of sight on via the sales funnel, but that just hasn't been booked yet versus what's not materialized at all yet, and then how the outlook change reflects those two things. Yeah, look at it. I, I think it's it's hard to put a number on the extended uh, deal time. It depends actually on the platform and portfolio. So there's quite a big difference between, for example, GC and LCMS on that. But what I would say in general, the the deal time is is prolonged. Um, the win rates, of course, haven't changed. They're still very very strong, but that deal time is is prolonged. And I think you know if you look at it in the second half when we're looking at the visibility of what we're seeing in the funnel, the best thing and we're doing is staying close to the customers on this one, making sure we're there um, to help them, of course, uh, with their decisions and help them get up and running when they make the decision to purchase on it. So we're going to see this continued ex extended deal time, I think, uh, through the end or through the second half. Yeah, and Dan, you know, I, I wish I could say we have all of the orders in-house uh, for the second half uh, for instruments. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so we have much better visibility into Q3, but we will need, uh, you know, a continued performance in Q3. Now, we've had several quarters here of book to bills being greater than one um, yeah, in um uh, in our instrumentation portfolio, which is which is a positive thing. I would say, hey, we're building some backlog. Um, and uh, as Porig mentioned earlier in the call, you know, particularly in LSAG, LSAG um, orders grew ex China, um, and, and that uh, is the first time that's happened in, in, in several quarters. So we are seeing some um, some positives, and if you look at the second half of the year. Our performance relative to last year should improve just because of you know the the benefit of easier compares and and so um, we're not again looking for that that huge inflection and um, we're not expecting um, also as Porig was saying a a, a constriction so to speak uh, or an acceleration of those deal deal funnels uh, we're expecting them to stay sim very similar to the way they are right now yeah I think just to, to close off Bob I think. The deal, the deal closure timelines remain at an elevated but very stable level. They're not deteriorating further, which I think is a really good sign. And as, and um, in terms of 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 the the funnel, funnel is stable, no cancellations within that, which of course is very important to see. Okay, and then maybe on uh, as a follow up on Biofarm, I'm just curious about the extent to which the IRA is part of the conversation there these days. It sounded like last year the industry kind of contemplated an adjustment as the idea was coming into the picture. So do you think spending expectations got right size for a period of time? Or are you finding that's sort of a continual evolving conversation? Thanks. Yeah, I would say it's a continually evolving conversation. You know, clearly on the NSAD, NASD, NSAD side, we've seen an impact, you know, um, from, from the IRA, something we're watching clo closely, but I think this will, will evolve over time. What we're seeing, you know, in terms of programs based around pricing provisions, there's definitely has been an impact on that side.
Our next question will come from the line of Josh Waldman with Cleveland Research. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks for uh, taking my questions. A couple for you. Uh, Porig or, or Bob, I wondered if you could talk a bit more on how instrument orders progress sequentially. I mean, did orders deteriorate uh, over the last 90 days or really just a function of orders not improving as you expected? And then wondered if you could comment on what you're seeing from new orders, a new order perspective across the key product categories within LSAG, you know, categories like LCMS, GC, ICP. Um, I guess, is it fair to assume LCMS is driving the majority of the softness, just given the comments on pharma? I don't know if you want to take that one, Bob. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. So yeah, I, I wouldn't characterize it, uh, Josh, as a deterioration. Um, it actually just wasn't the inflection or the acceleration that we were expecting. You know, we did, uh, as, uh, as we were saying here, we did have a, a positive book to bill, and um, ex-China, you know, orders grew. Um, they just didn't grow the, to the extent that we expected them to, particularly in April, uh, which we would typically have uh, a, a higher uh, acceleration, just kind of given the, the end of the end of the quarter. Um, in terms of um, the the platform. What you're seeing is um, the platforms that are, are more um, focused on, on pharma being the areas that are the weakest. So LC and LCMS are, are, are weaker than the applied markets. Um, and you can kind of see that in our end markets as well. And, and so we were expecting those to, to kind of um, perform better this year. And, and we're just still seeing that, uh, uh, I'd say, lower than expected uh, performance uh, from the from the standpoint of order uh, order velocity. Got it. Okay. Then a follow up on China. Wondered if you could comment a bit more hey, on hey, where hey, Josh, all the I, I would say. So, sorry, just one one yep. one quick. So one thing I sure. would say though is if I looked at the the performance, the revenue performance versus the order performance, the order performance was significantly better in Q2 on those two main platforms. Than the, than the revenue. So again, these are p points that says we are getting out of it, maybe not at the pace that we were expecting. So, um, and uh, so th th those are some, some, some positive uh, points uh, that would suggest that we're gonna, um, you know, continue to, um, it's not gonna deteriorate coming out in, in Q2, or excuse me, in second half, sorry. Is it, we, in what, what were the two platforms? LC and LCMS. So, you yeah, know, okay. our, our, yep, yep. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Um, and then a follow-up on China, just wondered if you could comment a bit more on where all you're seeing uh, demand coming softer than expected from a new bookings perspective, and then a bit more detail on how you're contemplating uh, the stimulus. I mean, it sounds like you saw improved bidding and funnel activity on the prospects of stimulus, but just, you know, wondered if you could provide you know, what's giving you the confidence that that, you know, stimulus-related funnel ends up converting to, you know, orders and sales at some point in the future? Yeah, maybe maybe starting on the stimulus. You know, this is – it's an extremely large program, multi-year program. It's, it's, it's very real. We've seen some of the customers, uh, you know, with activities asking us to bid on some of the things, even though they're not sure exactly yet how the mechanisms would work. So that gives us great confidence for, for 25 just from that. But I said earlier also the indirect impact of confidence in science and technology in China. It's, it's a real vote of confidence by the government in, in making sure we uh, – making sure they get the, uh, the markets going again. So, so I think in, in Q2 we saw meaningful like, softness extend to all, all markets because, remember, the stimulus is not only academia and government. It's across all markets. And that, that has really come at once. And we, we did see at the, you know, at the end of the quarter, we also started to see customers postpone purchasing decisions. They've told us, right? So they said we're going to postpone, and they tried to gauge if there's any benefit of the stimulus-related funding. And that's normal. I think that's expected. If you didn't see that, then the, fund, the stimulus would, would have different questions. And while we believe that the stimulus program will ultimately be long-term positive, we, we really don't see any benefit in H2, and that's why we're, we're roughly reducing by 70 million. Got it. Did, did you see stimulus-related postponing and pharma and CDMO as well, or more just government accounts? Yeah, it was both government and non-government accounts across the board. Um, so I would say it was um, uh, 
pretty pretty broad beyond pharma. Okay, got it. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Katherine Schulte with Baird. Please go ahead. Hey guys, thanks for the questions. Maybe just sticking on China stimulus to start off. Is there any way to quantify the increase in funnel activity that you've seen there just as we try to think about the potential opportunity in future years? Yeah, what we're seeing is a postponement and I think it's really too early to tell on the funnel side on, on, on if, if the customers are still working out the mechanisms about how it works. We're, we're, we're still waiting to see on the impact on the funnel, particularly for 25, it's too early to tell. Okay, and then on LSAG, what was performance in the quarter excluding China? And then any commentary on the pharma and mark and market specifically for that business outside of China in the quarter? Bob, you want to take this one? Yeah, so um, our LSAG business um, declined 13% globally. Ex China, it was down 8%. Our next question will come from the line of Paul Knight with KeyBank. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the time. The um, Within the 34% of uh, business that's uh, pharma, what portion is uh, biopharma or large molecule, Bob? It's 45, roughly 45%. And what's the overall growth rate of that piece, do you think? Long term or in the quarter? In the quarter and long term. Yeah, so if we looked at our biopharma um, business, it was down roughly 12%. Small molecule was down roughly 10%. Uh, total pharma was down 11%. So kind of gives you a sense. I think. Yeah, I would say, I would say before we get on to the long term, Bob, um, for biopharma, really tough compare was mid teens plus mid teens last year on that side. But what we're seeing is the long-term um, prospects for this market is very strong. Yep. Yeah, and then I know that you got you have always been very in, or aggressive and innovative on your M and A for biologics. Are you seeing that market open up on the M and A side uh, of that marketplace? You mean in the in, in the space itself? Are is pricing becoming more realistic as you think about your acquisition strategy? Yeah, well, I think there's long memories, you know, so people uh, don't forget the elevated uh, yeah. price uh, pricing for, for assets. But we're going to remain very disciplined. You know, it's going to become an increasingly uh, bigger part of the puzzle for us, M&A, uh, but we're going to make sure that we do it in a very disciplined way, linked to strategy, and, of course, looking at areas where we can we can double down in growth factors. So um, we're, we're, we're very um, focused on that going forward, but uh, I would say – while pricing maybe has come down in little areas across across the board, people have long memories. Okay, thank you. I will now turn the call back over to Parmita Huja for closing remarks. Thanks, Regina, and thanks everyone for joining the call today. With that, we would like to end the call. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's call. Thank you for joining. You may now disconnect. <laughs>